Angeles Amato. Eleven years ago, I had an ordinary life with all the normal worries and dreams that we all have. And then one night, everything changed. I came home to find that the man I loved, the father of our two boys, had taken his own life. Since that day, I've been learning what it means to lose someone you love to suicide, and why it's a very different kind of grief to any other. I'm going on a journey around Britain to meet people like me, who faced a similar loss, and to try to break down some of the stigma and the fear that exists around suicide. Because if there's one thing I've learnt, above all else, it's that we have to talk about this. It's really important that we talk. You may not know this, but there's around 6,000 suicides a year in the UK. And every year, there are thousands of people like me who are left behind. And we often feel isolated, as if we shouldn't really talk about what's happened. Luckily, I have a family for whom talking has never been a problem. Since my partner Mark died, every Sunday, my mum Jenny comes round to my house in Birkenhead to cook lunch for the whole family. The more concerned she is about us, the more food we get. Um, roast lamb, uh, roast potatoes, creamed potatoes, new potatoes, <laughs> carrots, cauliflower, broccoli, managed to, two types of peas, garden peas, mushy peas. So we're going for the low carb option today. Oh, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> Go mad on a Sunday. <laughs> we are very close family. Yeah. Which stood us in good stead because when it, when the whole situation around Mark happened, it kind of, um, that became just really pivotal to everything. It was such a big shock because we had a conversation the night before, haven't we, about Christmas dinner and what we were cooking and where we were having it. All right. All right. All right. Come on, dip your crown into the peas. <laughs> A lot's changed in the last 11 years. Oh, yeah, good, thanks. I didn't have a career then. Hi, how are you doing? I work in the art world now. I've got a new partner, Dwayne. And my youngest son, Benjamin, is 14 years old. He was three when Mark died. Alexi was 13. He's just turned 25. We often talk about Mark. We want them to remember him. Positively, and not just because of that one night. We wanted the boys to grow up and it, for it to be about how Mark lived and how funny he was and how he thought he was an amazing cook and he probably wasn't and how he thought he was an amazing musician, musician. and it probably was. It's just a musician. <laughs> but we wanted it to be about that, didn't we? We didn't yeah. want it to just Concept be about... Concept of memory is not about... Well, not just about how he died. It was It was really important. It was that how, the... how we lived. Thank you. Dwayne, where are you going in between the kids? I'm going are you going in between the kids? When this happens to you as an ordinary person, as an ordinary family, very, very quickly you become aware of the stigma attached to somebody taking their own life. There's lots of people that don't know how to speak to you. There's lots of people who treat you differently. Does anybody else want mushy peas? <laughs> I think the only way that we can help to challenge the stigma and deal with the legacy of this is to be really honest and open. And I'm kind of hoping that that's what me talking about my experiences is going to, in some very, very tiny way, um, help to achieve. <laughs> I think we were probably both 16 in this picture and it was when we kind of not long started dating and um, we thought it would be great to go on this day out to Southport I think it was. You can see how, um, how young I am and how young he is. Me and Mark met um, when we were at school. I was 16 and he was only 15 and we went on a date and his friends were saying to him 
oh my god you're going out with a sixth former that's great and my friends were saying to me what are you doing with a fifth year what what are you doing and it kind of went from there really he was great fun he was quirky he was interesting he was dangerous i was 18 when i had alexia at that point we kind of thought we knew it all and actually you look back and we, we didn't know anything we were kind of just muddling our way through and then this picture is just Mark and me and um, Benjamin. Benjamin was born when I was 29 and Mark was 28. I mean, now I look back and I think was that time of excitement and kind of hope really, was that just a stick in plaster? So the relationship building up to Mark's death, I was feeling very restless. We'd always kind of managed to talk through things. So we talked about it a lot. We talked about the fact that I was feeling as if I was kind of almost claustrophobic. We decided that we were going to um, live separately for a little while. If I'd have realised the potential consequences of then what happened, maybe I wouldn't have said anything, maybe I would have just continued things and, and, and kept quiet. Who, you know, who knows? It's Hindsight's a wonderful thing, isn't it? This is the park that we used to come to a lot and um, the house where we were, where, where Mark's, Mark's um, death occurred is actually just over the way there. I haven't been back here for years. It's, it's uh, mixed emotions, definitely. On the day that Mark actually died, I had just started a new job. The boys went off to school and Mark normally left just before me, but actually I left first that, that morning. In the afternoon, uh, I got a call from Mark's work um, saying that he hadn't turned in. And it wasn't until six o'clock that I actually managed to get hold of him on the phone. And he said, remember that I love you. And look, I'm, I'm really, really sorry. And I thought that he was apologizing for the fact that he hadn't gone to work. I collected the boys from my mum's house and drove home. I walked up the path, put the key in the door, opened the door, and then as I opened the door, I could just see his his outline. And at that point, I realised that, in fact, Mark had hung himself in the hallway. And behind me, I could hear the boys laughing. It was the most unreal, surreal, situation I, I can't I mean I find it hard to describe it really because it, it it was just something that never ever enters your head in your wildest imagination Mark's death was devastating for me but as I've since discovered it wasn't unusual Four out of every five people who take their own lives are male, and suicide is the biggest killer of men under 50 in Britain. But I didn't know any of that 11 years ago. I was just one of the many people left in shock, with very little guidance about where to go or who to talk to. It wasn't until about nine months after Mark died that one morning I woke up and I felt very um, disorientated. Um, I felt as if I didn't know if I wanted to sit down or stand up or eat or drink or just felt very, very disorientated. Fortunately, I found a support group known as SOBS. At first, when I saw the, the acronym of Survivors of Bereavement by Suicide, I genuinely didn't know what to expect. I think for me, when I lost my son, um, and I look back now and they were very dark days, and I was just desperate and desperate for help in how to deal with the feelings, the emotions, the unanswered questions. And I get loads of support. I've got wonderful friends and family. But sometimes I think, do they really understand us? Do people understand? Because I think that death by suicide is horrendous and it's worse than any other kind of death, I think. Well, I, I used the word a few years ago, but a tsunami of grief hits you. Yeah. You, you know, you, you, you think you're doing all right, you have an all that day. Yeah. And then one. Yeah. And, uh, whew. Some of the people here have been coming to the support group for many years. Others, like Rebecca, are much more recently bereaved. I can't understand why my husband's left my children. And I see the pain in their faces. 
I don't know, you can write a letter to your children and then take your life. How old are they? 14 and 18. How long has it been? Five weeks. It's just very recent, isn't it? Yeah. I, I, I feel guilty in that I should have recognised that he was yeah. in that dark place. And I feel that partly responsible for not um, perhaps understanding mm. when he was a bit low, but I never thought he'd ever do this. Mm. My son, there were no signs whatsoever. No. Um, no. As a mum, you, you question yourself, like, have I been a bad parent? Have I, you know, yeah. what have I done that's, you know, made him do this? But there were no signs. Mm. Um, it was just like that. Mm. I remember going to the group Losing someone in this way is a very specific type of bereavement. We experience emotions that are very specific to suicide. And it, it doesn't follow a natural pattern. There's no book that is going to say to you, you're going to go through this process, you know, your grief is going to follow this path and this is what you're going to experience at this time. It's literally that you can feel different emotions from hour to hour, from minute to minute sometimes. It is different. And that you can go for a little bit and you're all right. And then all of a sudden it smacks you again. What are you supposed to do? Just, you stay in bed all day mm -hmm. and just hope it's all going to go away. You feel like that? Because believe me, I do. And yesterday I thought to myself, what is the point? What is the point to all this? Mm -hmm. There's something about being bereaved by suicide and the fact that that person that you loved and that you knew or you thought you knew has taken their own life by, by their own hand. Coming to terms with that can be very, very difficult and, and can be a very long road. If my husband had had a heart attack, been murdered, knocked off his bike, although it would have been desperate, I could perhaps it was out of his hands. But it's the thought that that morning he got up, he made me a cup of tea in bed, he had his breakfast, he washed his dishes, he emptied the dishwasher, he drove to work, and three hours later he was dead. And that's what I find very, very hard to, to, to understand. Grief is unbelievable. I can't tell you how painful the grief is. Like, um, if you've ever lost your, uh, your wallet, or, or something happens and you get a shock, your heart stops, that's it, but it's constant, constant. And I want, the I want the world to stop, but it's not, it's carrying on, and that's, that's you know, it's, it's very, 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 very strange. When you openly talk about suicide, people are frightened of it, and that's not because people don't necessarily want to understand it, it's because for a long time those conversations haven't been happening. So it's just ordinary people who have been bereaved in the same way who are willing to come along and share their experiences we are trying in our in our small way to to deal with the taboo of this subject one of the questions that haunts you after suicide is why mark hadn't shown any obvious signs of depression and like most people who take their own lives he didn't leave a note I've come to Glasgow University to meet Professor Rory O'Connor, one of the UK's leading experts on suicide, to see if he's got any answers for me. What a place to work. It's absolutely gorgeous. Great to meet you. Nice okay. to meet you. So, can we take a wee wander around? Yeah, great. For me, the, the big question after Mark died was why did, did he take his life? Our research can never answer the question of why a particular individuals so for example we, we can't answer the question sadly why mark mm. took his own life what we try and do is understand the common features of a suicidal mind we uh, speak to people who've tried to kill themselves they try and understand the sort of factors which led up to why they uh, attempted to end their own lives and it, it's not a selfish act suicide is not a selfish act it's a, 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 an expression of unbearable pain people take their own lives often not because they want to kill themselves but because they want the pain to end we talk about this constrictive thinking this tunnel vision this tunnel logic, so that the person maybe is not necessarily looking outwardly distressed, mm. but has decided themselves that, that for whatever set of reasons, and usually complex reasons, I'm going to kill myself. Mm. In a way, that's the end of their problems, mm. because they, they, in their mind they find the solution. Professor O'Connor and his team have conducted tests with over 2,000 people who've attempted suicide. Harder. I'd like you to say stop when it first feels uncomfortable. Let's just take it for a second. Karen. So this is a pressure meter or an algometer. We exert pressure on, on people's hands and what that does is get some sort of objective measure of pain sensitivity. Because okay. what we think might be going on is that people who attempt suicide have a higher pain threshold. Mm -hmm. They can put up with more physical pain yeah. than, than the average person. Yeah, so this is a measure of pain tolerance. Okay. Okay. Stop when you feel it's becoming too uncomfortable to continue. Stop. 
The pain threshold test is one of many conducted at the lab, from which Professor O'Connor has built up a picture of the common factors that can lead to suicide. But this is us trying to piece together the sort of pathway to suicide. How is it that some people develop suicidal thoughts and others don't? And so what we think is vitally important is if you're feeling defeated and humiliated, and you feel that you can't escape from that, you feel trapped, you're much more likely to become suicidal. In particular, this sense of being trapped. So if, if you've got that defeat plus the feeling of this kind of cool constricted view of the world, then that seems to be a pretty kind of lethal combination. Absolutely. I'm just wondering, when, you, when you're looking at things like entrapment, it, is such, it must be such a subjective thing. How do you even start having that conversation? Well, what we use are established questionnaires, which I'll just show you. It's 16 questions. And crucially, we don't just look at one question. They come together into yeah. an overall score of how trapped you feel. So we've got, um, I have a strong desire to escape from things in my life. I feel powerless to change myself. I would like to escape from my thoughts and my feelings. It's, they feel like very, very poignant questions. Do, do people sometimes find them very difficult to answer? We've been doing this work for 20 years, mm -hmm. and in general, people are really, uh, really glad that somebody's asking about them and, uh, and trying to understand why suicide happens. Professor O'Connor's commitment to answering that question is more than just professional. Like me, he's lost someone to suicide. Six years ago, a very close friend of mine that took her own life, and that really was um, just devastating, and particularly devastating because I'd been working in this area for so long, and I, I just felt such a failure that I'd let that person down, mm -hmm. and that we were really, really close, and, and basically, why couldn't I have prevented her suicide? What it really highlights for me is, yes, as a researcher, I understand the importance of objectivity, but it's more personal now, um, really, really much more personal now. When Rory described how in the suicidal mind, you know, that constriction of the worldview and how problems that, that you or I may consider as small may be magnified within that constricted view and may seem insurmountable. I could just kind of feel myself really, really relating to that and just wondering whether that was how Mark's view of the world had changed. It's really got me thinking about it in a completely different way, in a way that I haven't thought about it in, in 11 years. For people like me, who've lost a partner to suicide, one of the biggest problems is how you explain what's happened to your children. This is a picture of Ben, and um, it's when he was about two and a half. And um, he's got his buggy here. He used to love pushing his buggy. Not a care in the world. Benjamin's questions used to be, why did daddy die? So we had that question quite a lot. When is daddy back? When is daddy back? When is daddy back? And he would say that over and over again, and I would then have to answer him each time, saying, daddy's not, not coming back, Benjamin. And then there's another picture here that's a little bit later. This was done um, in 2009. And then at about five, I think it was, instead of saying to me, why did daddy die? He said, how did daddy die? So that one word, completely changed the question. So I said to him, do you know when mummy tells you that you can't tie a scarf around your neck tight, why, why do I tell you that? And he said, because it'll stop me breathing. And I said, well, um, daddy knew that if he tied something um, very, 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 very tight, that it would stop him breathing and he would go to heaven. So that's, that's what happened to daddy. And he said, okay. I just remember that moment. It took me a few minutes to get myself together and, um, and be able to actually look at him. My fear for the boys was that, although I always wanted to talk very openly about their father with them, I also didn't want it to become an option for them. So it, was a, it continues to be a very, very fine line between having the conversation that I feel very strongly should happen and yet not having the conversation to the point where it becomes so normalised that it becomes like an, an okay thing to consider. Talking to my boys about their dad's death wasn't helped by the wall of silence around suicide. But now, a few people in the public eye are starting to speak out about their experiences. I've come to West London to meet the actor David Robb who plays Dr. Clarkson in the TV series Downton Abbey. 
18 months ago, his wife, the actress Bryony McRoberts, having struggled with anorexia, took her own life at a local tube station. Hello. 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 Can I interest you in a tea or a coffee? I would love a cup of tea, please. That'd right. be great. Thank you. Thank you. That's great. Thank you very much. Should I come through Yes, please. Yeah. I'll follow you. I don't know. I'm, I'm on your turf. <laughs> These are sort of, well, random photos. So, this is Bernie about five, six years ago. Pretty lady. Absolutely beautiful. So she's about 50 ish, though. Wow. She doesn't, um, she doesn't look anywhere near no. 50. Well, that's the play that we met in. Let's see. Well, there she is. 18. Me, 28. We had this love scene. <laughs> and did it just last a bit longer each night? It sort of did, yeah. <laughs> She had That's to grow amazing. up in it. In the last act, she had her hair up. I always remember. And I used to have to stand beside, be, behind her, walking on the stage at one point. And I loved the back of her ears. I can remember quite clearly sort of falling in love with the back of her head. Really? <laughs> yeah, long time ago, 1975. How long is it since your husband died? Uh, it's a little while now. It's um, 11 years. But you found Mark, didn't you? Yeah, I did, yeah. I, just can't, I can't imagine the, the level of shock that I must have involved. Mm. I had the opposite. Bryony left the house before I came down in the morning and didn't come back. Mm -hmm. And then the police turned up. Really? At about four o'clock in the afternoon. Because um, she had my Oyster card, my you know, mm. uh, ticket thing. And I was advised by the police and the coroner not to see her body. Mm. So I never saw her. She just walked out of my life. So it's as if she's been erased in a nuclear explosion. Mm. That's that's a very weird thing. And when I think of the memory, the, the you know the physical memory of the, and the smell of her and the, and the back of her ears, and all of the things that made her unique, are no longer exist. How? How? Because I touched them for thirty-eight years, and that's difficult. Very difficult. I have the opposite in that the last time I held him was was when he'd already passed away. And so it although my head can compute that it was you know, kind of I know that it was very real and all of that, it still has mm -hmm. that same surreal mm -hmm. sense that you yeah. have. So it's small comfort. Mm -hmm. Small comfort. Mm -hmm. It must have been so difficult for you to, to go through such a private time so so publicly. It, it exploded in the media, yeah. only for 24 hours, but, but it was huge. Yeah. And you suddenly realise that, that it wasn't just the people that you invited to the funeral that were going to pitch up, there were going to be hundreds of other people. Yeah. And it, it, in, in some ways that was rather magnificent. Yeah. It, was, it, was, it was stupendous. And if she'd seen, I mean, everybody said, God, if she could see. Yeah. Yeah. I had a supermarket thing where a total stranger came up and said, I'm so sorry. I just want to say I, I, I always used to see you and your wife in here on a Saturday morning, and I know what happened. I'm just so terribly sorry. Mm. Well, that's very touching as well. Yeah, of course it is. For me, 18 months was a really difficult time because it felt as if everyone else's life was carrying on. Well, and I think that's what I found, I, I found difficult. You know, because it's quite right that people are getting on and, 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 and not forgetting, but it, it, it falls into some kind of perspective, but it's not really falling into perspective yeah. for me. Yeah. You kind of think, so who was this person that I was with? Mm. Because she wouldn't have done that. Mm. And I don't think there's any real coming to terms with that. You just have to somehow live with it. Mm. Tell me it gets better. Yeah, I can absolutely promise you that it gets really? better. Yeah, absolutely. I've lost the person who was a rock for me. You know, and in terms of taste and, and uh, you know, being a homemaker mm. and, and a brilliant partner mm. and a glamorous woman, So it goes round and round, doesn't it? Meeting David has taken me right back to where I was 18 months after Mark's death. 
when I was still lost in the sense of utter disbelief that the person I thought I knew could take their own life. It makes you feel as though you'll never be able to fully trust anyone or anything ever again. When you're in that place, it feels impossible that you can ever rebuild your life. But my experience is that you can, if you can talk about it. Eleven years after Mark's death, my oldest son, Alexei, feels like he's done all of his talking. His dad was a keen amateur guitarist, and Alexei now expresses himself as the drummer of the band, I Alone. His brother Benjamin and I, of course, are his biggest fans. He started drumming when he was about 14. I don't know whether some of it was because he'd not long lost his dad or whether it was just something that would have happened naturally anyway. But now he's been drumming for 10 years and you can tell he loves it. As a parent, you kind of live for those moments where you see your child just completely absorbed in what they're doing and just completely enjoying what they're doing. And you get a real sense of that when you see Alexi drum. When he first started playing gigs, it was really, really difficult because when I used to go and watch him play, and it's kind of still the case now, really, you do kind of wish every time he's on stage that his dad could see what he was doing, really, because I think he'd be so proud of him. Nights like tonight, he, he would have loved this. now that there was a part of Mark that couldn't share how he was really feeling with us, his family. But I've often wondered whether things might have turned out differently if he'd been able to get away for a bit and speak to someone else. Here in a residential street in North London, there's an organisation called The Matry, which offers that option to people who feel suicidal. I've come to meet Angela Rodriguez, who's worked here for the last eight years. Hello, Angela. Hello, Hello, Angela. Angela. Hello. 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 Thank you so much. So, Angela, when people come here, what, what are they coming here for? Because it, it's not, it's quite a special place, isn't it? It is. A lot of our callers will have been googling ways to kill themselves. Really? Yeah. We pop up at the top of the page and then okay. they see Maytree and they'll have a read and that's they then have a think about it, then they'll call us. And is Maitri a, a one-off? Or is it, you know, are there, are there other Maitri's around the country no. or is, is this the only one? No, this is the only one so far. What we do, mm -hmm. we offer a safe space. We work with suicide. Mm -hmm. This is where you can come in and be honest mm -hmm. without that fear of feeling judged um, or upsetting anyone. After an initial assessment, Maitri offers its guests a five-day residential break from the pressures of everyday life. So... On this floor, we've got two bedrooms and a bathroom. And this is one of our newly decorated rooms. So they're spacious and they're airy. Oh, wow. This is lovely. And as you can see, we've got nurse alarms. for oh, people that have, if oh, anyone okay. has difficulty in the night, they okay. press that. So they're designed with, you know, with safety. Again, you'll notice that the curtain pole... It's a collapsible, aren't they? Yeah. yeah. yeah so if I anyone, noticed that as soon as I walked in. Yeah, if anyone does try and make an attempt, it's not going to okay. work. Have you ever had guests here who have actually taken it as an opportunity to attempt to take their lives yeah. here? Yeah, and what we say to guests, we make it very clear, we have a guest agreement mm. um, that if someone does make an attempt here, that um, we will have to intervene. The most important part, if that happens, 
is being with them and trying to hold on to our mm. relationship with them mm. and not to not to just hand it over to someone mm. and walk away. We, mm. won't, we won't do that. Mm. We'll be with them. We'll stay with them at the hospital. Okay. And, and hopefully, depending on how, how bad it would ever be, if they're able to come back and finish their stay, they come mm. back. The May Tree was set up 20 years ago by two former Samaritans who wanted to offer a refuge to people who felt isolated by their suicidal feelings. I mean, the stigma around suicide, I mean, I felt it as a bereaved person. Um, is it something that you, that you feel or that you think that the guests feel? Oh, absolutely. We need to be talking about suicide. This, we live in a society that's scared to talk about death, mm. let alone suicide. We need to be able to be open and talk about it without that fear of being judged. That is so important. Mm. We need to use the word, stop hiding from it. Mm. Stop hiding from it, let's talk about it. And that's the key, talking. How did you first come across Matri? Was it in a working capacity or was it in a different...? In a different no, way? I'd actually um, made several attempts um, myself. I'd been through the mental health system. Mm. Um, I'd been in psychiatric units. Um, and I struggled um, to find a reason to live. Mm. I mean, I couldn't even leave the house. I couldn't even take my children to school. Mm. How many children did you have then? I had three, three daughters, okay. yeah, who were small. I suppose we're on opposite sides of the fence because I, I have wanted and thought about how Mark must have felt just before he took his life. That's been a major part of my bereavement and my, my grief, really, is trying desperately to understand how, how it feels to be in that place where you really you really are convinced at 100% that your children will be better off without you. I remember kissing my children. Good night. Yes. Sorry. Okay. And just thinking that they could be better off, that they would not have to watch their mother, mm -hmm. not cope. Mm -hmm. You are in a box whichever way you turn. Mm. It's just blackness all around you. Mm. It's almost like being in... You know, I remember times thinking, oh, come on, there must be a way. And it's been like being in treacle. Mm. You cannot move. You're rooted and the world's just whizzing past you. Mm. You can't mm. see. And that's, that's what's so important here because for someone that's walking through this door that is suicidal, at that point, they may never have had contact with someone else that is suicidal. Mm. So when you see guests mm. sitting down and talking, that also enables them to see that, wow, I'm, it's not just me, other people do suffer. And, and around this table, the conversation, it can just mm. happen. Mm. It's very organic, it's very natural. It's just been wonderful to see this today because you're doing amazing things here. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Almost all of Maytree's guests say that they suffer fewer suicidal thoughts and attempts after staying here. Which makes you wonder why, when suicide is such a big problem, this is the only house of its kind in the UK. Hindsight is a wonderful thing, but I just wish that if Mark had known about somewhere like Maytree, that maybe he could have just come somewhere like this for a few days. I just wish that he'd have known about this. If the stigma around suicide can make it difficult for adults to talk about it, imagine what it's like being a child. When Mark died, my boys, Alexi and Ben, lost one parent and were left with me, the other, completely traumatised. While I did my best to let them know that they could always talk about what had happened to us, I'm interested in how other families deal with suicide, and I've come to meet the Ebdens, who live in rural Somerset. It's like somewhere like that. Farmer Simon Ebden lost his wife Dominique to suicide five years ago, leaving him to bring up their five daughters on his own. Three years ago, he met his new partner, Vicky. Where should we put it? Here we are. Hi, guys. There we are. There's yours, then. Do we need a bigger tree? Yeah. To fit it all on? They've kindly invited me to their home a few days before Christmas. Hello. Hello. Nice to meet you. Come through, and then you can meet the family. So, hi, girls. Hello. 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 This is Rosie. Hello, Rosie. Nice to meet you. This is Molly. Hello, Molly. And that is Izzy. 
Charlotte. Great to meet you. You're Emma, aren't you? Just spotted all your pictures, they're gorgeous. Vicky came to live with the Ebden girls two years after the death of their mum, Dominie. When you first became part of the family, you weren't just dealing with Simon's grief. You were dealing with the with the five girls as well, and the baby was a baby. There were days when, you know, mum's name would be mentioned and mm. they would get upset and Simon would do he would cry all the time. Mm. And the girls would they just couldn't bear it. Mm. So it stopped them from crying. Mm. So they were too scared to cry because it made Simon cry mm. and then it was just a vicious circle. I've come from a family where we do a lot of talking. I think it's important if you have something inside you that you let it out. Vicky contacted Winston's Wish, a charity which works with bereaved children, including those who've lost their mum or their dad to suicide. So when you went to Winston's Wish, tell me about that. They talked up to us and told us about like the camp. Okay. That the weekend yeah. we went and then we went to it. It was really fun because it, it wasn't actually much talking. Oh, it was, was, it was um, but they tried not to make it like, upsetting. Yeah. yeah. We like had on the first the day we did all those of, act yeah, activities and stuff. Activities like archery and like, And we were in like groups. Each of us were in a different group. So we did all the games first so that I think it was like a trust building thing. Yeah. And we all sort of like learned a lot about each other. Yeah. It sounds like mm. stupid stuff but no, but you, you, it doesn't matter. Yeah. But you you got to know each of the first yeah. as kind of people. It was good because you realise that you're really not the only one. Yeah. Okay. Like, even though they say that you're not, like, you don't really know anyone. Mm. But then you go there and everyone's in the exact same boat. He struggled shy, didn't he? He found yeah, it really upsetting. He didn't like it. No. You know. She still doesn't like it. She still doesn't like talking about it. Tell me why. I just don't think I have to. Okay. It's not that I don't want to. I don't mind talking about it. Yeah. It's, it's okay. Mm. It's just, yeah, it's upsetting. Yeah. yeah. Mm. This is Dominic. Let's have a look at this one. This is your one. Is this, this the one is that on you... This, this is on holiday. This is the one that you... Do you have this one in your bedroom? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. My boys have pictures of their dad in mm. their bedroom too. This is quite a nice natural photo. Yeah. Um, which we only found a few days ago. Dominic, who was my best friend, person I loved, she was everything. Fantastic mother, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. You never think she would do anything like that, you know. But obviously, she was in a bad place, mm -hmm. you know, and was just, well, couldn't take it any longer. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> it's very sad. There are days when it's actually really difficult. Mm. But they are coming through it, mm. and maybe they won't ever mm. get over it. I don't. Mm. You can't get over something mm. like that. Mm. But you can adjust, and you can learn to live and live alongside what's happened. And that's kind of what I wanted for them. I just think from everything that I've heard today, the fact that you came into the family and enabled those conversations to happen, mm. I yeah. think, is probably the greatest gift that you could have given any of those five girls. Did you get those? No. And where's Rosie's? Lovely. But it all looks beautiful, doesn't it? Yeah, That's all right, Joanne. Can you hang you? Before I go home for Christmas myself, I'm heading to Norfolk to meet a woman called Jackie Page. I think um, going to see Jackie today is going to be uh, really difficult out of all of the, the people that we've met. Jackie has had to deal with one of the most tragic aspects of suicide, that those left behind are sometimes at risk themselves. 24 years ago, her husband Rod took his own life. Seven years ago, her son Simon did the same. Today is going to be me facing my, my worst fears, really. So it's going to be... Um, it's going to be a tricky one, I think. That was Simon when he was probably about three or four there with the snow with his rabbit, bless him. <laughs> that was on holiday in Cornwall with Katie. Um, and that, oh, that was graduation day. We just um, oh. asked someone if they'd take a photograph. That was 2001. Mm. So it was six years later, almost to the day that he died. Yeah. yeah. Wow. You lost your husband, Rod. He 
took his own life in 1990. In 1990. It was very, very hard when he died. I was left with two small children, an eight-year-old and um, a ten-year-old. Mm. Simon asked me a lot of questions about mm. how Rod died, mm. but those were questions that he asked me a lot when he was much older, I would say, when he was in his, probably his early 20s. Mm. Um, and I've regretted at times actually telling him because, you know, he said, how did Dad die, Mum? And I obviously Rod hung himself. Yeah. And I think, was I too open? Did mm. I, you know? Um, but I, I, as a parent, I've always been honest with yeah. him and, and open in that way. He went down to London. He wanted to go into finance. Um, and then his troubles began, really. Mm. Um, he'd ring me virtually every day. He'd got anxiety um, and stress with the job and he started to become ill. Um, but anyway, he came home and even though he was so ill, we had six amazing months really. And I'm grateful that I had those six months with him. The day that Simon died, I came home. I walked in the house and um, his boots were by the door and. Um, I sort of the light didn't like what the light was on at the bottom of the stairs, and I just mm. he was there, hands at the top of the stairs. Um, I just went absolutely hysterical, and I remember holding him. It was just totally horrendous, absolutely horrendous. I mean, for me listening to you now, it is. Um, I knew today was going to be um, difficult because you're right. Mm? My worst fear is that, you know, one of the boys would um, do the same thing. It really is my worst fear. You can't go through the rest of your life mm. thinking that my circumstances aren't necessarily going to become your circumstances. Mm. And there's no guarantees, is there? Mm. No. But if you keep talking to them and... I think that's the thing, really, you know, you do... You keep having the conversations, don't you? And you keep kind of, you know, you keep the, the lines of communication open. And so, where, where are you at now? Where so, am I at now? Yeah. I'm at acceptance with it. Mm. I don't want to accept it, but I can't mm. change it. And I think when it, I got to about two and a half years after Simon's death, I reached it. I used to go to his grave every day. But then I got to a stage uh, when, when um, I was thinking about moving to Norfolk, and I just thought, you can't continue like this. You've got to change. Um, and Norfolk's been a, a, a turning point for me. Really? I love it down here. <laughs> Since moving to the Norfolk coast, Jackie has started a new career and set up a support group for others who've lost people they love to suicide. What did you hope to gain by moving here, Jackie? Peace of mind, I think. Time for myself, some reflection time. It's been a turning point, really. I, I love the place. I'm home now. Yeah. I mean, it's so beautiful here, I can definitely why and I mean, I, life isn't wonderful all the time is yeah. it nobody does but everything since i've been here has gone right for me personally it's, it's been a, a, a healer really yeah i knew today was going to be really difficult once jackie started to talk about simon you know losing her son i knew it was going to be emotional but um i think that yeah i kind of hadn't realized what an impact that was actually going to have on me Before going home to see my boys, there's someone I'm keen to catch up with. I've been thinking a lot about Rebecca, who I met at the Liverpool support group. It's only ten weeks since her husband Andy died. After any suspected suicide, there has to be a public inquest, and the one into Andy's death took place yesterday just before Christmas. That's in uh, Turkey, just before he died, actually, about a month before. And then that's one of us at um, a charity ball a few years ago. You look amazing. Hi. Oh, well, Absolutely yeah. Absolutely amazing. Have your hair done. That's one of sugar, yeah. Yeah. OK. It's, um, it's so lovely to see you again mm -hmm. after, after I met you in the support group. Mm -hmm. And yesterday was the inquest. a particularly difficult day. Mm -hmm. I was a little bit disappointed that um, it went ahead, but only been three days before Christmas. Yeah. I asked if it would be postponed because the children are on holiday from school. Mm -hmm. They're not I mean, they're not little, but even so, you have to consider them, don't you? Yeah. And did it 
last for a long time, the, no. the, the session, how, how long were you? Gosh, it must have only been about 30 minutes, I yeah. guess that. It just felt as though um, we were dealing with, uh, I don't know, a parking ticket or mm. a shoplifting offence mm. or something. Mm. And, and I, I don't agree with it being open to the public either. I can't understand why. He wasn't a criminal, he'd done nothing wrong. Mm. You know, he hadn't, uh, hadn't hurt anybody else. Mm. But yes, it's a, such a private thing that becomes so public yeah. and you have no control over. Yeah, that's right. So did they go through the events of the day? They went through obviously the date and the time he was found, who found him, who identified him. And then they went into the cause of death. Mm. But they went, and that, that really upset me, because yeah. I burst into tears, because they went into detail about the rope around his neck. Mm. Apparently he died very quickly. Mm. So I was comforted in a little way that he died quickly. Mm. But I don't think I needed to know the full details. Mm. And then the verdict was um, suicide. And um, the husband was depressed. Okay. And that was it, basically. I, he honestly didn't realise all the impact of, uh, of what he was what he did mm. and the after effects. Mm. And he would have wanted to leave me, I don't think, with all of this to deal with. No. But he has. He was in a dark place and, you know, couldn't take any more. Yeah. How did you feel? Did you feel, I, did I feel, you feel I that feel day? I feel angry and let down. Mm. Yeah, I do. He's died and I'm now left mm. with a lot of things he couldn't cope with mm. on my own. So, yes, he's out of pain. But my pain started now. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Mm. So what? Yeah. It really, really is. Mm. Yeah. Sorry. No, it's alright. And how, how do the boys grow up, you know? How do they form relationships? That worries me as well. Mm. You know, I always say that things happen in a child's life affect them when they get older, don't they? Mm. And that's what worries me when they grow up. I think that is, for me, you've kind of yeah. just hit the nail on the head, really. For yeah. me, that is the the most difficult part of the, the legacy of this, really, is is we share the same fear, you yeah. know. Um, I mean, I have to say, Rebecca, you strike me as, as somebody who isn't just incredibly strong. I, I mean, the fact that we're sitting here having a conversation today and it's the day after the inquest and it's only 10 weeks since, since you've Lost your husband. Mm. My GP wants me to go in on the 5th of January with a five-year plan. <laughs> <laughs> I don't quite know what the five-year plan's going to be, because I can't think about what my next five-minute plan is, never mind five years. A five-year a five plan? A five-year plan. Mm. Oh, God, I don't think I could even do that now, let alone the three months after, after Mark died. I've made it home to Birkenhead for Christmas. And while I'm still convinced that honesty and openness are the best way to deal with losing someone you love to suicide, when it comes to your own kids, you never stop worrying. I've been speaking to lots of different people and, um, and some of it's been quite upsetting. And it kind of just got me thinking about whether the fact that we'd always been really honest with each other and we'd always been able to talk about it. Well, whether you felt actually we had always been able to talk about it. We have, I think. Mm. But yeah, on the on the whole, I think I've come to terms with it quite well. Yeah. Do you think you always have questions? No, I think I've, I think I've asked all my questions. But again, I will ask the same questions mm -hmm. because I forget the answers. You know what worries me about the way that Dad died, and yeah. it worries me that if you were ever feeling, you know, you kind of were struggling with anything, and I always say to you, don't I? Talk to him about it. Yeah. Do you think that because of what we've been through, you will always be able to talk to me about things? Yeah. Mm. I would always tell you, of course, but mm. before I actually felt the need to do something. Yeah. Yeah. So do you think that we're okay? Yeah. Do you think I've gone? I did the right thing by telling you. Absolutely. Yeah. Positively. Thank you. You're welcome. We're not having Sunday lunch this week because it's Christmas, but my mum's organised a Christmas Eve tea. We've got some of Mrs Bushton's delightful caramel cupcakes. And as usual, there's enough to feed an army. Ham, cranberry, stuffing, um, plain ham, ham and tomato, and some plain turkey. Mark's death was the worst thing that's ever happened to us as a family. But 11 years on, like Benjamin, I think we're doing okay. You don't ever get over losing someone to suicide. 
But if you can talk about it, then one day you can be happy again. More than anything, that's what I've learned. Thank you.